Welcome back everyone. My today's lesson is about osteomyelitis in children. Osteomyelitis refers to an infection of a bone. And the bone infection in children are important because of their potential to cause permanent disabilities. The frequency of skeletal infections is greater in infants and the toddlers than in older children. The risk is greatest if the physis or the gross plate of a bone is damaged. Early recognition and appropriate therapy minimizes permanent damage. When we see the epidemiology of osteomyelitis, osteomyelitis is common in young children and about 30% occur by 2 years of age and 50% by 5 years of age. Osteomyelitis is relatively more common in boys than in girls and usually by a factor of 2 to 1. The majority of cases of osteomyelitis are of hematogenous origin. Minor closed trauma is a common preceding event in around 30% of cases. When we see the etiology of osteomyelitis, bacteria are the most common pathogens in acute skeletal infections. In osteomyelitis, Staphylococcus is the most common infecting organism in all age groups including newborns. Uh, when we see the age-specific etiologic agent, in neonates, Staphylococcus, Gropivis, Streptococcus, and Gram-negative enteric bacilli such as E. coli are the most common cause. Whereas in older children and in adolescents, Esaurus, Hemophilus, Influenza, Kingella, Kingella, Group A Streptococcus, and Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, and also Pseudomonas originosa can be the cause if, the, if there is a preceding puncture wound of the foot. If a child is having sickle cell anemia, Salmonella species, Staphylococcus, and Pneumococcus are the most common cause. When we see the risk factors for having uh, osteomyelitis, sickle cell disease, immunodeficiency, sepsis, minor trauma coincident with bacteremia, indwelling vascular catheters, and chronic hemodialysis uh, with vascular access is the most common risk factors. When we see the pathogenesis of osteomyelitis, uh, microorganisms can be introduced into bone in three ways, but the, uh, the most common is hematogenous delivery. Uh, the other two mechanisms are either direct inoculation or local invasion from a contagious infection. Uh, bacterial deposition in the metaphysis or endothelial cells permit bacterial passage and the sluggish blood flow in this area. And phagocytes migrate to the site and this causes inflammatory exudates at metaphysial uh, site and it causes metaphysial abscess. And then protolytic enzymes and toxic oxygen radicals and the cytokines causes uh, decrease in oxygen tension and the pH, osteolysis and tissue destruction. And this causes uh, via Havertian system and the Volkmann's canal exudate split to the subperiosteal spaces. This is the uh, mechanism by which bone damage occurs in osteomyelitis. Uh, in newborns, thin cortex and the loosely applied perosteum are poor barriers to the spread of infection. Nutrient metaphysial capillaries perforate the epiphyseal growth plate and the capsules of the diarthroidal joint frequently extends to or is slightly distal to the epiphyseal plate. So joint involvement is more common in neonates. Uh, in older infants and toddlers, the cortex becomes thicker and the perosteum is slightly more dense and the metaphysial capillaries atrophy as the epiphysis becomes ossified and a distinct physial plate is formed. Uh, this distinct physial plate is formed uh, mostly starting at the age of 8 months and it is completed at the age of 18 months. This spread of infection to the joint is unusual in older infants unless the metaphysis is intracapsular as uh, occurs with the radius and the humerus in the elbow and the femur in the hip uh, respectively. Uh, the metaphysial cortex is considerably thicker with a dense fibrous perosteum in children and adolescents, and the infection is more contained in the rarely ruptures and the spread to the uh, outer cortical lamella. Uh, the most common bones that are involved are long bones, and the long bones are principally involved in the femur and the tibia constitute almost half of the cases, and upper extremity account for one fourth of the cases, and the flat bones are less frequently or less commonly affected. Usually, single bone involved, but in units, two or more bones are involved in half of the cases. Uh, regarding the clinical manifestation of osteomyelitis, the signs and the symptoms are highly depend on the age of the patient, 
and the illness signs and the symptoms are often subtle. In neonates, constitutional symptoms are frequently mild and they exhibit pseudo paralysis or pain with movement of the affected extremity like when changing the uppers. And half of neonates do not have fever and they may not have uh, they may not appear ill at all. And they uh, most of them continue to feed well. In older infants and the children, uh, older infants and the children are more likely to have fever, pain, and the localizing signs such as edema, rhythm, and worms. And with involvement of the lower extremities, limp or refusal to walk is seen in approximately half of patients, and tenderness, swelling, and redness appear at the site of the uh, infection. Uh, regarding the duration of infection, uh, in acute case, typically acute osteomyelitis has gradual onset over several days to one week, whereas subacute one is uh, it is associated with longer duration of symptoms, weeks to months, and in subacute case, they might have a broad abscess with radiographic lucency and the surrounding reactive bone. And in chronic case, uh, sign and symptoms of bone inflammation have been persistent for at least two weeks, and there is radiographic evidence of devitalized bone. And they develop after major trauma or surgical procedure, and the inadequate treatment of acute osteomyelitis also uh, predisposed for chronic osteomyelitis. Regarding diagnosis, uh, we might send blood culture, aspiration from, for gram stained culture, CBC disease differential, ESR and CRP, which are very sensitive in bone infection, uh, but they are non-specific and they might be normal in the first few days of infection and important in assessing response to therapy and identifying complication. So ESR and CRP are mainly used to uh, check for response to therapies and for diagnosing osteomyelitis. The other diagnostic modalities for osteomyelitis radiographic evaluation. Uh, the first one is plain radiograph. Radiographic changes that are characteristics of osteomyelitis include leatic uh, sclerosis indicating chronic infection, and uh, most of the time within 72 hours, soft tissue swelling appears, and after 5 to 7 days, periosteal reaction is seen, and leatic bone changes near 7 to 14 days, and it needs 30 to 50 percent of bone matrix to lose uh, before the bone changes appear and the flat and the irregular bones are uh, it takes longer time to appear the other imaging modalities are ct and mri ct demonstrates osseous and soft tissue abnormalities and it is ideal for detecting gas in soft tissue and mri is the best radiographic imaging techniques for identification of abscess and it provides precise anatomic details of subperosteal pass and the accumulation of purulent debris and it's, it differentiates between bone and the soft tissue infection. So MRI is the best imaging technique for uh, osteomyelitis. Uh, radionuclide studies are valuable if multiple uh, focus of infection is suspected. Uh, the other thing is about treatment of osteomyelitis. Optimal treatment of skeletal infections require co collaborative efforts of pediatricians, orthopedic surgeons and radiologists. Antibiotic choice depends on the age of the patient, underlying medical condition, suspected pathogen and their susceptibility, and antibiotic safety and efficacy and availability. And also it can be modified based on the uh, growth and the sensitivity on the culture media. Uh, in neonates, uh, most of the time we use cloxacillin plus cefotaxime or ceftriaxone or gentamicin and vancomycin if insulin resistance suffer is suspected. And beyond the neonatal age, Cloxacillin or clindamycin or vancomycin plus ceftriaxone is uh, mainly used. And this is modified based on the pathogens identified on culture. And if pathogen is not identified and the patient remains uh, improving, antibiotics is continued. If it is not improving, reaspiration and biopsy is needed. And other diagnostic uh, probabilities or other differential diagnosis should be considered. Uh, Duration of antibiotic therapy is individualized depending on the organism isolated and a total of four to six weeks of therapy might be required and we should have to monitor by using a clinical response and the weekly ESR and the CRP. And changing antibiotics from the intravenous route to the oral administration is then when patient conditions are stabilized, usually five to ten days of IV antibiotics, and the patient has been a febrile for 48 to 72 hours and local sign symptoms of infection are reduced considerably and the peripheral leukocyte counts are normalized and the ESR has decreased by at least 20 percent or there has been 50 percent decrease in the concentration of uh, CRP 
and a dose two or two three times that used for other infection is prescribed uh, during the oral route surgical therapy is indicated if there is subperiosteal and the soft tissue abscess and intramedullary prolancy Sucester should be removed and the contagious infection for such should be uh, divided adequately and ostomalites of the femoral head with hip joint involvement is also uh, another indication for surgical therapy. Regarding prognosis, improvement is rapid when pass drained and appropriate antibiotic therapy is given and failure to improve or worsen by 72 hours require a review of appropriateness of antibiotic therapy, the need for surgical intervention and also we should have to uh, uh, think of other differential diagnosis such as bone tumors and the like. And the CRP typically normalizes within seven days after the start of treatment, and ASR typically raises for five to seven days, and then it starts to fall slowly, dropping sharply after 10 to 14 days of therapy. Uh, recurrence of disease and the development of chronic infections after treatment occur in less than 10% of patients, and long term follow up is necessary with close attention to range of motion of joints and uh, bone lengths. Thank you for your attention. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and to get more uh, videos regarding pediatric problems.